The Calb Report is funded by a grant from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. From the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., this is the Kalb Report with Marvin Kalb. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club and to another edition of the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb, and our subject tonight, the twilight of network news, a conversation with Ted Koppel about democracy and the press. I use the word twilight to suggest that network news, as we've known it, is on its way out and something new is emerging. Whether what's new will satisfy the urgent needs of our democracy cannot be known at this time. Let's hope that it will. Because without a free, inquisitive, occasionally rambunctious media, we will not be living in an open society. A free press and an open society are intimately linked one dependent on the other. If network news is in its twilight, then perhaps our democracy is facing a turning point as well. I've asked an old colleague and friend, Ted Koppel, to help us understand the changes in network news and what those changes might mean for our society. Ted is known best for his 25 years as anchor and host of Nightline, but he's also been a foreign correspondent a war correspondent, an author, and he's covered many political campaigns. I share something with you now. In preparing for this program, I ran into the following interesting thought. Ted joined ABC News in 1963. I joined CBS in 1957. If my arithmetic is right, together we represent more than 100 years of journalistic experience. I mean, that's enough to depress anybody. <laughs> so Ted, what in God's name have we learned about our sacred craft of journalism in all of these years? Well, I think we've learned not to make predictions. And, <laughs> and, um, so what are you predicting? <laughs> I, I predict that uh, your, your title, provocative as it may be, may be premature. I think that when Americans finally realize how bad things are and what terrible straits our political system uh, is in, I think there may be a resurgence of the, of the kind of journalism that you and I grew up with. That's a marvelous, very optimistic thought. Well, actually, no. It's a terrible thought because it's... it's <laughs> It suggests the ship of state is almost going to have to sink before people are willing to jump back into the lifeboats again. No, but do you think that we can truly even define journalism? I mean, if somebody walked into the room right now and came from Mars and said, what are these guys talking about? And you say, journalism, explain it to that guy. Well, I guess the simplest way to explain it is to take it back to when, when you and I were young and when you and I began in this business. And, and uh, for a moment, I'll limit it to broadcast journalism. When you and I were young, there were three networks. If you wanted to be seen and heard on, on national television, you had to do it on ABC, NBC, or CBS. Um, when I was in Vietnam in the late 1960s, mid-60s, late 60s, if I did a piece out in the field, it would be three days sometimes before that piece got on the air. It meant that you, you prepared your stories with more of a sense of context. You prepared your stories knowing that they had to survive. Two days, three days, sometimes even more than that. Uh, I have nothing but respect, admiration, and, and a little bit of sympathy for our colleagues today who quite literally have to report almost around the clock. Live. Live. 
And I mean, you know, whether they're working for television or radio or a newspaper, they're going to have to file for the blog, they're going to have to tweet, they're going to have to do their little Facebook number. The only thing I never see in those schedules for which adequate time has been left Sleep? <laughs> is reporting. <laughs> ah! Um, I sometimes wonder how they, how they find the time to actually gather the material. But it's all there. We have more media available to us today, mm -hmm. more means of communicating information <coughs> than have ever existed in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. We're so enchanted, though, with our ability to be fast that I think we've sometimes lost connection with what we're saying and why. I, I want to pursue that, but I want to ask you first, why did you even get into this business? Oh, I got into it uh, probably for much the same reason you did. Uh, now, that's unfair, because what I'm going to say is I, I don't think I would have been terribly good at anything else. <laughs> um, when I, I was born and, and uh, spent the first 13 years of my life in England, uh, my father listened to the BBC during World War II. I was just a little tyke in those days, but I still remember, at least my, my memory may be playing tricks on me, but I think I still remember hearing Edward R. Murrow's reports being rebroadcast on the BBC. And I swear that from earliest childhood on, all I ever wanted to do and be was a journalist. Hmm preferably as, as close to Edward R. Murrow as I could make it, which, which probably isn't too far from what, what No, not too far you. at all. Murrow, um, I, I did a piece for the New York Times Magazine section on Soviet youth, I think in, in the spring of 1957, and Murrow read it, liked it, called me, and said, can you come down and talk to me about Soviet youth? He was extremely curious about everything. And of course, I went down to talk to him, and the, the secretary said as I went in, you've got 30 minutes. That's it, max. I said, it's OK with me. Three hours later, she came in and said, I think, Ed, you've got other events today. But he used to get so absorbed in these things that I had listened to him earlier and then met him, and I was completely bowled over. This was a great journalist. and. He was really interested in the things that I was interested in. Well, and if you look back at the, at the men, I don't think he hired many women, did he, back in those there days? There were a I couple of women who were part of the World War II contingent at CBS, but they did not last. After the war, they went off for different reasons. But uh, the point I was going to make, whether it was an Eric Severide or a Howard K. Smith, the people that Ed Murrow hired, were people of substance, historians, mm -hmm. writers, mm -hmm. readers, people who, who cared about history. Uh, and sometimes when I, when I look at what passes for news on, on cable television, especially these days, I wonder where they find these people. Well, he did care a great deal. <laughs> he cared a great deal about writing. Yeah. And one of the points you were making earlier about some things that you wanted to last for three, four, five days before it would actually get on the air. It had to be written, and written well. Murrow cared a great deal about style and the way in which you presented uh, information. It was always, for me, Interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. Take a look at how often, when you're watching something being covered on cable television, and it, it requires great skill. I'm not denigrating it in, in any fashion. But notice how often what you're hearing is just whatever comes off the top of the head of the man or woman who is reporting. Take note of how rare it is for a script actually to be written. Now, you know, if you only have a couple of minutes to report something, there really is some skill required. I mean, the, the essence of journalism, after all, 
lies not simply in the reporting, but in separating the wheat from the chaff, in the editing, in, in determining why one thing is important to a story and another is not, in putting it into some kind of context, occasionally even historical context. Uh, you know, folks are pretty good at ad-libbing, but that takes more skill than most people have. Absolutely, and you've, you've taken us from what was and you've raised the lid just a little bit on what is in journalism today. What has changed? Tick off the major changes. Well, I mean, first of all, it is the, the biggest change, I always argue, came about in 1968. Now, 1968, you have to understand, was an extraordinary year. 1968 was the year of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. It was the year that Lyndon Johnson stepped down and said he wouldn't run for president again. The year that Martin Luther King was assassinated. The year that Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. The year of the riots at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. So it's not too surprising that we may not pay as much attention as we should to the birth of a new form of television news. The television news magazine began in 1968, mm. called, as you know, 60 Minutes. And 60 Minutes has done an extraordinary job over these last 44, they, 45 years. They've done amazing years. work. Amazing work. But it also did something that no television news program had ever done before. It made money. Ah. It turned a profit. <laughs> and that, To be clear about that, up to that point, it, if it happened, it was rarely spoken It was a rare of. thing. Yes. And we were, for the most part, a lost leader. Television news did not make money. Well, tell, tell folks what, what the famous, it uh, wasn't Frank Stanton, it was uh, the, uh, Bill Paley. Bill Paley, who came to you folks who were producers and journalists at CBS and said, Remember? Well, he, he used to call us the jewels in his crown. Well, he also That's said, don't mean. worry about making money. I've don't, got, I've got I've Jack, got Jack Benny. Benny to make money for right? me. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> don't, you guys don't worry about that. And what that meant was that when we went out to do a story, we were totally absorbed in the story. We weren't worried about how much money it would take to cover the story. We just did it. Even, even as late as 1980, I remember being able to charter a plane from Rome to Istanbul because you thought you might be able to get an interview with somebody important for your piece. We didn't have to check with New York at all. But now, now profit. We have become profit centers at the, at the networks and at the, you know, with the cable stations also. Being a profit center is a huge responsibility because it means that you start thinking in a different way. You start thinking not so much about what the public ought to hear, but rather what the public wants to hear. You are now in competition with the other networks, with the other news outlets, not just for audience, but you're in, you're in competition with them to make money. And the way you make money is, I'll give you a for instance, I, I may be doing my former colleagues at ABC an injustice, but I seem to recall that the last one-hour documentary that played in prime time was on the subject of Charlie Sheen <laughs> and his carousing, womanizing, all the other good things that he was doing, which were clearly of enormous interest to all of you because that's why they put it on the air. It got a big audience. This idea of the difference between need to know and ought to know, yeah. spell that out a little bit. Well, uh, when what you worry about is making money, you try to focus on those things that are A, most likely to attract an audience, and B, least likely to cost a great deal of money. So the first thing you do, I remember many years ago getting a call from my, my old friend and colleague, Peter Jennings. And Peter said, Ted, have the, have the bean counters been in touch with you? And I said, uh, as a matter of fact, I just got off the phone with him. 
And what the bean counters wanted to know from him and from me was, Ted, how many times in a year does Nightline use the Moscow Bureau? And they had asked Peter Jennings the same question. How many times a year does World News Tonight use the Moscow Bureau? And they asked the same thing of the anchor or the producer of, of 2020 and Good Morning America. And then they did a simple, a simple calculus. So the Moscow Bureau cost, let's say, $2 million a year. And among all the ABC programs, it was used, let's say, 50 times a year, 50 into 2 million. $40,000 a report? Wow. Close down the Moscow Bureau. Mm. And what happened with the mm. Moscow Bureau at ABC has happened, for the most part, at NBC, at CBS, right. at ABC. Right. Most of the overseas bureaus now are essentially just mail drops, where you may have some local employee keeping the office open, and when something really big happens in Cairo, when something really big happens in Mexico City, in Beijing, in Hong Kong, what you do is you ship in one of the star correspondents or even an anchor. But the difference between covering the news year after year after year in a country, maybe even learning the language, certainly getting to know the people, getting to know who the movers and shakers are and what the political dynamic in that country is, that really is not happening much anymore. I want to talk to you a little bit <clears throat> about the role of cable television, which you touched on before. In a recent interview with Bill O'Reilly of Fox, you derided ideological coverage of the news, bad for America, you said, making it difficult if not impossible for Congress to reach across the aisle and find compromise. You also wrote in an op-ed piece, this is not good for the republic. What do you mean? Uh, what I mean, and this goes back, it's really a continuation of the same theme. I mean, first of all, uh, in addition to demonstrating that network news divisions could make money, there was a technological <coughs> explosion. It wasn't just the three networks anymore. Now you had cable, you had satellite television, you had the internet. So now there are quite literally hundreds, even thousands of competitors out there. What is incredibly cheap to put on the air is a couple of people like you and me just yelling at each other. Talk. Right? <laughs> Talking. What draws an audience is when, in fact, we disagree when in fact we get nasty with one another. And what Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes demonstrated 15 years ago is that there really was a hunger in America for something that was less liberal than what the networks were putting on the air. And so Fox News was born, and Fox News has been hugely successful. Earns somewhere between one and one and a half billion dollars a year. Now, my current employers, uh, the folks over at NBC, had their own cable network, MSNBC. Wasn't doing very well. Wasn't making any money. And they took a look at what Fox had done, and they said, whoa, if they can make a billion and a half dollars a year doing news that skews to the right, if we only make half of that, that's still $750 million a year, let's skew to the left. And so you have, on cable television, news that caters to people who consider themselves progressives, news that caters to people who consider themselves to be conservatives. You have the afternoon radio talk shows, the evening radio talk shows, which cater largely to the conservative. You have the late night comedy shows, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, Bill Maher, that tend to cater more to the left. And the end result is that the, the area that has, that has gone more or less fallow is serious news organizations reporting the important events of the day without any kind of political bias. We have grown up as a nation now believing that we are entitled to hear views that essentially resonate to the views we already hold. 
And the end result of that becomes, and we have seen it this year with a lot of distinguished senators, congresspeople, leaving because their Olympia Snow left the Senate because she, she simply can't handle the nastiness anymore. And there's an awful lot of that, and you cannot in a democracy. You made, you made the point. Let me, let me just finish this Please. one line, Marvin. You cannot in a, in a democracy expect people to be able to reach across the aisles and make the accommodations for important issues if they are terrified that in so doing, they're going to expose themselves to the wrath of either the right or the left, either John Stewart's humor or Rush Limbaugh's sharp tongue. So what you said um, not too long ago was that the commercial success of both Fox and MSNBC has become a source of nonpartisan sadness for you. Absolutely. Meaning what? Meaning that all of, I mean, you and I have known for many, many years that we operated in a business. But as we were saying a few minutes ago, that business used to make all of its money with I Love Lucy and Jack Benny and 77 Sunset Strip and whatever else was hot back in the 60s and 70s, made so much money on those programs that they could afford to spend 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars a year covering the world. That is no longer the case. And that's dangerous. You know, my sense every now and then, Ted, is that though there are good journalists in cable television, mm -hmm. the whole package of cable television, when it is presented to the American people, tends to debase just about anything it touches. That doesn't mean that every conversation is bad, but it does mean that the package, to me, comes through as um, as a negative, as something that makes fun of people, that is overly critical, that is not real. Look, Fareed Zakaria does a program on Sunday mornings called GPS. Yes. First-rate television journalism. Mm -hmm. Fareed is a very smart man. He, he invites very smart people on his program and they talk about important issues in a smart way. I doubt that he has 200,000 people watching that show. I mean, mm -hmm. it's probably a fairly big audience if he gets that many. It's, it's on a Sunday morning, which is when programs like that still survive to one degree or another, but you're never going to see that program in prime time during the week. Is it in never. important? In your judgment, since cable television is the place where you're going to get right, left political conversation and CNN living in the middle so awkwardly and trying desperately to, to keep its base, is it doing good things for our democracy in your view? No, of course not. Is, is who doing good things? The whole idea of cable television. Um, no, but I, you know. I mean, I feel, I feel quite often that if you eliminate it, MSNBC, Fox, for which I do occasional commentary, and CNN, it would probably improve American democracy overnight. <laughs> Things would simply miraculously get better. People would talk to one another again, rather than engage in an artificial fight, which, what, which is what most of what cable television ends up Look, being. there, uh, you take someone like Rachel Maddow, for example. Rachel Very bright. Very bright. Theory, I was about to make the point. Rachel Meadows is a very smart woman, very smart, and, and could very easily in the old days, and should today. I'd love to see Rachel Maddow as the anchor of one of the evening news programs mm -hmm. on network television. Mm -hmm. But the price of that would be that she would have to keep her opinions to herself. It is her opinions that draw the viewership on MSNBC. Now, she's a very bright woman, as I said. 
but I don't want to know what she thinks about these issues. I really don't. I want to hear her informed reporting. I want to hear her interview people with that sharp mind of hers. I don't want to know where she comes down on a particular issue. But that is seen as hopelessly old-fashioned I was about days. to say, Ted... Those days God. are over. Yeah. As a matter of fact, excuse me for a minute. Um, I just want to take a minute now to remind our radio and television audiences that this is The Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb. Our guest today is Ted Koppel, our subject, the twilight of network news. Ted, you have described the good old days of journalism. I love this phrase as an imperfect, untidy, little Eden of journalism. You then went on to say that these days, broadcast news has been outflanked, overtaken by scores of other media options. Help us understand the need, the perceived need for these changes, because they not only affect the quality of network news, by the way, do you agree with me that it's in a twilight zone now? No, I, it is in a twilight. But remember, twilight is usually followed by night, and then dawn follows night. So I, I'm, still, I'm still hopeful. <laughs> I'm still hopeful. Um, it, you know, it's not going to stay this way forever. I think you know, what tends to happen in this country, Marvin, is, is you and I have observed over the last 50 or 60 years, politically, we tend to go too far to the right, and then we, we correct course, and we pass through the middle, and then we go too far to the left, and then we correct course again. I think what's happened to broadcast journalism requires a course correction. And as we come to realize that our educational system is not as good as we like to believe, that our healthcare system is not as good as we like to believe, that we are spending, on, I mean, there are so many things that are on the brink of taking us into real disaster. Not the least of them being, you know, the possibility of cyber warfare. I mean, that's something that big telev television news ought to be covering big time right big now. Time. Um, I am tremendously concerned by the fact that the American public and its military have never been as far apart as they are right now. We know nothing. I mean, you know, yeah, we do a terrific job of calling everyone in uniform a hero. We do a terrific job of welcoming them at airports, saying thank you for your service. We know nothing about what's going on in the military and what's more. The military and military operations these days are being, are being launched on the basis of drone attacks, CIA operatives, special operations forces out in the field, and all of that backed by civilian employees, civilian contractors, and we know next to nothing about what is being done by any of these groups. Because the reporting is not being done? Well, I mean, look, it's, it's because we have found that keeping, uh, that A, the American public won't stand for a draft, that B, the, the, uh, the professional military was not enough to fight all over the world as we are now fighting. I mean, you know, we've been focused on Iraq, mm -hmm. we've been focused mm -hmm. on Afghanistan, we actually believe that all the troops are coming back from Afghanistan. I'll tell you here and now, that's not going to happen. We will still have U.S. troops in Afghanistan a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. Where's the press? Where is it? That, well, obviously, these are not issues that the people who run our news programs today... Why but, not? because they don't draw an audience. What draws an audience is Charlie Sheen. What draws an audience is people yelling at each other. It's, you know, it's not enough to say these issues are important. We actually, I know it sounds totally idealistic, but when you and I became journalists as young men, we actually believed that we were entering a, a really a special chosen profession 
that meant something to a democracy. You that called was it a calling. A calling, exactly. And when you got into it and when I got into it, I was tremendously fortunate and ended up making a lot of money later on. Word of honor, I never thought I was going to get rich as a journalist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You didn't go into journalism. You don't go into journalism to become wealthy. The changes that we're talking about, you've already touched on this, the effect that it has on our society, on the business itself, um, on journalism itself. Uh, value systems change. I'm not saying that we can ever return to the good old days. Those, that's gone. That's done. But what worries me is whether we can take the value systems of old and try to see them preserved in the digital environment of today. Do you, do you think that's possible? Well, I, I not only think it's possible. I mean, you and I are, in a sense, we, we, we need a third person here, half our age telling us what is being accomplished in the digital arena. There are curators today who, because there are so many hundreds, so many thousands of websites, make it a point of saying, look, if you really want to know what's good in the area, I mean what's interesting in the area of foreign policy, or let's say Persian Gulf, or let's say the environment, or let's say cyber warfare, we can lead you in the right direction. And the technology is there so that you and I can gather material, gather information in a fashion that is infinitely easier than the one we used to use 40 years ago, 50 years ago. We can sit at our laptop right now and we can harvest information. Where's the reporting? I mean, you're well, getting a ton of information. These curators can provide any amount of information, look, but I'll, how reliable is the information? Exactly. Is it based upon actual reporting? Look, I think, the, I think two key points have to be made. A, there is brilliant material out there that is being well reported according to standards that you and I would envy. How do you know that? Uh, because I've been told. <laughs> On the other hand, the, the implication of your question is absolutely correct. We don't know often when something comes across on the Internet. We have no way of knowing what its provenance is. We have no way of knowing what the, what the intention, what the goals, what the biases of the people who are putting that out there. Uh, you know. And. I'll, I'll tell you something that I learned the other day from one of these TED Talks. I don't know if you're familiar. It has nothing to do with me, these TED Talks. Um, and it was on the subject of Google. And the, the speaker was making the point that he is what would be called a progressive. And he said a friend of his who was very conservative, they took their respective laptops, their computers, and they simply typed into the search engine the word Egypt. And they got totally different responses. Why? Because there is that process going on. Every time that we search for something on our laptop, we are not only gathering information, we are giving information. We're giving information about what we buy, about what we find interesting about what we like, about perhaps what our, what our political biases may be, so that in theory, a search engine that ought to be giving me objective information, and you and I ought to get the same information if we type in the same, the same word. Mm -hmm. Not so anymore. That's kind of scary. Because somebody is making up his or her mind as to what it is that we want. It's not somebody. It, it, is. It, it, is a, it is a series of O's and ones. It is a series of, it is, it is the computer. What is the word I'm looking for? The <laughs> algorithm, thank you. <laughs> it is the algorithm. The which algorithm is, uh, is fine, and I understand that it exists, and I respect it, and I will salute it. It's there. 
But I want to know what all of that has to do with journalism. Who gets up in the morning and covers something? Who's going to go out and cover a war? Who's going to go out and cover a campaign? Without the journalist being there doing the ABCs of information gathering, honest information gathering, all of this other stuff is baloney to yeah. me. You're, I mean, look, there, there are plenty of people who are going to be out there doing the gathering. But the, the key word... The fact that, let me interrupt, that's not true. Well, in the coverage of war today, there are fewer reporters covering the war in Afghanistan now than there's ever been. Hmm. Fewer. When you went in in the fewer, Iraq war... Fewer American reporters. American and others as well. Well, look, I frequently of an evening now will watch the BBC or okay. Al Jazeera because particularly when things are going on in the Middle East, I'm going to learn more from the folks out there who actually speak Arabic and know the area, know the region. But do we know that they are reporters? Well, I, we know they speak Arabic. No, we know that they are reporters. Do we know that they are objective reporters? That's uh, a different okay. question. Well, do we okay. know that? We no, don't. We don't. But the fact of the matter is we've almost given up on objective reporters in our own country. We That's have, my question. It is still possible. It is still possible, and you and I do it every day, to pick up the New York Times, to listen to NPR, to pick up the Wall Street Journal, yes, yes. to watch the, the news hour. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the outlets are there. We have to look a little, I mean, you know, our old friend Jim Lehrer used to say, we're the program that dares to be dull. Mm -hmm. And I once said to Jim, sometimes, my friend, I think you're a little too daring. <laughs> But it's there. There is still good journalism being committed. The good journalists can't help it if the public in droves seems to be moving in other directions. I'm simply making the point, and I don't know whether, whether I'm wishing for this to happen, because as I say, I think it'll only happen when people realize how devastating the consequences are of not having objective journalists out there. Ted, do you know Clark Kent? Know him well? We, we have on occasion used the same phone booth. <laughs> Clark Kent is no longer a reporter for the Daily Planet. What does he do now? He's a blogger. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, if you pick up, if you pick where, up. Where does he change? Well, do you, <laughs> Probably in the curator's kitchen, yes. <laughs> someplace like that. But that is an indication to me of how profoundly different the journalism of years ago to today. I'm not saying that there isn't journalism today. I'm saying that it's so much more difficult to find. And it's the areas that you will go out to try to find it are not terribly reliable. And I'd like to think about um, sort of the North Star of journalism today. When you started, you had somebody like Rune Arledge at ABC who did extraordinary things at that network, including starting Nightline. I mean, with me, it was Ed Murrow and a lot of other people at CBS. But who are the Arledges and the Murrows of today in today's world? Look, the fact of the matter is, when Rune Eilidge came on, he had been the president of ABC Sports. Right. And we at ABC News were terrified of this guy who came in wearing his jungle suit and, and his red, I mean, his, his golden uh, bracelets that he wore. We th and, and he was not one of the champions of, what, of great journalism, when he came on. He became that. He evolved. And he evolved in some large measure because he ran up against immovable objects like Howard K. Smith and Frank Reynolds and people who still believed that good journalism was important. And nobody... He, he recognized the good journalism and moved toward it. Well, he recognized it, but uh, look, I'll, I'll 
tell you the backstory of Nightline. For about a year before the Iran hostage crisis, Rue Knowledge came to us in the news division and said, anytime something of real major importance happens, I want to do a late night special on it, 11.30. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I don't care. He was trying to, he initially wanted to get a one hour newscast on at the dinner hour at 6.30. <coughs> the affiliated stations around the country would not go along. Mm. So Roon decided that he was going to seize that time period. And by the time we got to the Iran hostage crisis, after about the fifth day, the sixth day, the seventh day, we were running out of things to say. We were running out of things to report. And Rune said to us, I don't care. Tell me what the difference is between a Sunni and a Shiite. Tell me about the Shah and how he came to power. Tell me, I don't care what. He kept that program going because he recognized that there was a tremendous American appetite for this story. Had it not been for that appetite, Nightline would never have been born. And also, uh, you were at ABC, which did not have a very important program in that time slot. That's correct. In you didn't words, have a Tonight Show, for example. Or a Letterman Show. Or the Letterman right. Show, something but, like that. But I'll tell you something, and one of the things that has changed enormously. When Nightline began in March of 1980, you, had, uh, on, uh, you didn't have the Letterman Show yet on CBS. They would rerun some old cop drama. But among the three programs, The Tonight Show, The Cop Drama, and Nightline, we had 70% of all the homes watching television at 11.30 at night. Really? 70%. These days, The Tonight Show, Nightline, and uh, The Letterman, Letterman Show are lucky to have 25%. That's what's happened because what you didn't have 35 years ago was cable, satellite, uh, you know, the internet, and all of those things have diluted the importance and the reach of the network. So maybe twilight is too soft a word. <laughs> no, because you still have, I mean, even though it's only 25%, the evening newscasts, for example, uh, among the three of them, I suspect they still have between 15 and 20 million viewers every More night. More than that, 20 to 25 million. 20 to 25 million. When you and I were reporting from the State Department, it was more than that. It was 40 million, 50 million. I mean, I think Cronkite alone probably had about 20 million people. Um, every night. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, no, that, that, that certainly is true. The responsibilities of journalism to democracy and to our society. I want you to talk about that a little bit more. I want you to explain to me why there is this connection between the flow of news and a vibrant society. Look, if the American public, the voting public, is ignorant of the issues, is uninformed, how can it make intelligent decisions about whom to pick? It's bad enough that the Citizens United decision of the Supreme Court has now resulted in, I think the New York Times the other day said, that the amount of money that was spent on all the election campaigns, all of them, six billion dollars. Oh. Now, I, I was shocked by that. I moderated a discussion the other morning between Karl Rove and James Carville, and Rove's How reaction... How lucky can one guy be? It was, <laughs> it was actually, it, it was fascinating, but, uh, you know, Mr. Rove made the point that we spent infinitely more than that on dog food. That's absurd. Uh, yes, it is. It is. Because much as I have always loved our pets and, and love pets in general, the fact of the matter is if our elections end up being reduced to the snarling and shouting and innuendo, 
you know, people keep saying, well, things were much worse in Jefferson's time. Yes, they were. But you only had broadsheets that were being distributed. You didn't have everyone walking around with his or her own little communications device. Information now is spread so ubiquitously, is spread so quickly, so instantaneously, that if we don't have reliable, trustworthy, objective sources of information, then our whole electoral, uh, electoral structure is going to collapse of its own weight. You know, Ted, there was that um, CNN story during that awful Hurricane Sandy week about how the New York Stock Exchange was under three feet of water. Of course, it wasn't true. Right. It wasn't true at all. CNN got that story not from one of its reporters. CNN got the story from an online message board on the National Weather Service's website. So they got a line, three feet of water, New York Stock, and they put it out. I don't want to pick on CNN because it could have been done by somebody else too. But that to me is one of the dangers in trying to retain a best standard, some practice, some place where you can turn and say this is the right way of doing things and this is simply wrong. And I have the impression these days, despite um, all of the good things that you have said, about all the curators and whatever. All of that stuff being said, I am left with an uneasy feeling that I don't know where all of the information is coming from. Right. I don't have a feeling that, remember years ago when we knew every cameraman who was taking pictures of some big event in Cairo, we knew exactly, Joe Musrov of CBS, was taking that picture, and you knew that it was an objective look at what was happening at that time. I don't have any feel for that at all today. I don't know who's taking the pictures. I don't know that they're even working for a network. They may be working for some small outfit hired by the network because the network doesn't want to bring in its own cameraman. It'll take too much. A couple of points. No, number one, notice the number of times if you watch more than one newscast in an evening. Notice the number of times that you will see precisely the same video on all three networks yes. when it comes from overseas, in large measure because the networks don't have their own reporters, don't have their own camera people over there anymore, and they have bought it all from the same single source. Point number two, what is wrong, after all, with having a local reporter covering the event? The local reporter, after all, speaks the language, knows the people. Well, let's say that local reporter is reporting from Tehran. And that local reporter knows that if he or she makes a misstep in what he or she reports, they're going to be arrested. They're going to be thrown in jail. The American reporter may get thrown out of the country, but that's probably the worst thing that's going to happen. And finally, I find that there is absolutely no willingness on the part of our critics to believe that objectivity in journalism is possible. And I keep hearing that argument. How can you? There's no such thing as absolute objectivity. To which I say, when you go to hire a lawyer, do you ask that lawyer, tell me, do you like me? I mean, do you really, really like me? Because if you don't like me, you're not going to be able to put your heart into this thing. You expect that lawyer to act as a professional. When you go to see a doctor, you're not asking that doctor what his or her politics are. You simply want that doctor to deal with you on the basis of her best professional expertise. And whether or not our critics want to believe it, I argue, and I think you'll agree with me, that there really was a time, and there really remain in this country today, men and women who can be professional journalists capable of objectivity. 
That doesn't mean that they don't go home at night and rail against the darkness. It doesn't mean that they don't have favorites in an election. But it does mean that, I mean, to this day, you've known my wife, Grace Ann, for many, many years. Grace Ann doesn't know how I vote in an election. Really? I don't tell her. I don't think it's appropriate. Wow. And you're still married. <laughs> Let me put it this way. She knows everything else about me. I think she can figure it out, but I've never told her. That's so interesting. What does that, what does that say? What does that really indicate? It indicates, uh, you know, I have believed since I was a very young reporter that my personal opinions have no place in the reporting that I do. But when you talk to somebody like Bill O'Reilly, for example, who was my student many years ago, and I should have flunked him. <laughs> uh, um, Bill believes profoundly, deeply, that you are a, you're a biased guy. You're the left. Why? Because you worked at ABC. I has given up on years ago, definitely of the left because I was at CBS. And I would say to him, you haven't a clue as to how I vote. He said, of course I know. Everybody knows. And that attitude has been accepted as That's a kind of truth. That's what I'm saying. By so many people. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, un until we are prepared to accept the principle that objectivity or at least the a genuine effort toward objectivity in journalism is possible. We're going to be, you know, uh, the late, great Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to say, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, not entitled to his own facts. These days, we've turned that on its head. These days, we believe that everyone is indeed entitled to his own facts. You want right-wing facts? We've got the factory for you. You want left-wing facts? We've got the plant that'll put it out for you. So how can we make it clear to people that if they watch, for example, NBC Nightly News, the CBS Evening News, World News Channel, there is, there is a basic impulse there on the part of the anchor and the reporters to tell it straight. But cable is where you're getting the opinion. Yeah. Cable says you're getting opinion also on the networks. So everybody is running around in a circle pointing fingers at everybody else, saying you're as biased as everybody else, but you're not admitting it. Look, I, think the, I, I don't think it's so much a matter of bias at the networks. I, I, I don't I've, think so at all. No, I, I really agree. don't. I think the problem at the networks these days is they simply are not putting the money <clears throat> into the kind of news coverage that is vital to a democracy. How would the money help? The money would help in that you would, for one thing, you would open up your, when has the world ever been, in your experience, a more dangerous place than it is right now? Oh, well, and, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> I, I happen to believe that at the worst times of the Cold War, yes, we went to the brink of nuclear war with the Cuban Missile Crisis, but the fact of the matter is there was a balance between the great powers. These days, we need information from the third world more than we have ever needed it before. We don't have the reporters out there. That's absolutely true. And I'm sorry to say at this particular time that we've run out of time. Hmm. I want to thank our wonderful audience here for being so polite and nice and being with us tonight. And um, they have been able to see us in this magic of the internet if they flick on right now, they can actually see us, um, not just on cable, but they can see us through the internet all over the world. It's a magnificent thing. And I want to thank our guest, Ted Koppel, for sharing his time and insights with us. Let me, let me close with the following thought. We are all dazzled by the digital age, and understandably so. The speed, the access, everything live, it's truly amazing. But every now and then, I worry that we may be losing sight of the fact that this new technology is only a tool 
It's a tool for the dissemination of what we as journalists have discovered. It can never be considered more important than the content of what we have discovered. Hourly daily broadcasts, a story that needs telling, a crime or a misdeed or a misjudgment that needs exploring. I look out and I ask you all, are there any new Edward R. Murrows in this audience? We need you now more than ever to help sustain our democracy. Good, honest, bold, unafraid, even on occasion rambunctious, outrageous journalism is essential to democracy. Murrow once said, this is no time for fear, and he was right. So young Murrows, rise up. Rise up. Ted and I have done the best we can. Now it's your turn. Use these modern tools, but use them well. Because otherwise, as Murrow once said, it's all just lights and wires in a box. So that's it for now. I'm Marvin Kalb, and quoting Murrow once again, good night and good luck. <laughs>